Gentlewoman, noun. A woman who meets the harsh pressures of modern life with thoughtfulness, care, and kindness. She is confident and, without needing to shout, exudes a powerful presence. Introduction. I am rooted, but I flow. Virginia Woolf. What does the word gentle make you think of? Seductive whispering? Weak handshakes? A bit of a pushover? As adjectives go, it isn't one we find ourselves typing into our Tinder profiles very often. Gentle sounds old-fashioned. It hasn't really found its place in today's world. Unless it's applied to men, of course, because everyone likes a gentleman. Blokes think he's a decent bloke. Straight women think he's a catch. He is refined, confident, kind and solicitous. What is the female equivalent? Lovely lady feels to Jane Austen. Good woman sounds biblical. Cool girl is fine when you're a teenager, but then what? I believe we need the term gentlewoman now more than ever. But in order to define what a gentlewoman is, we need to understand what it means to be gentle as a woman in the modern world. I believe there is soft power in meeting the pressures of life with a measured, tender, kind approach. And this book will help such an attitude infiltrate the way you understand yourself as well as how you choose to live. Make no mistake, being gentle doesn't make you weak. A gentlewoman is strong, ambitious, confident, fearless, and is always seeking to educate herself. She's living the rough reality, but she's doing it with grace. If a gentlewoman smashes a glass ceiling at work, she's sure to pick up all the shards, clearing the way for those coming up behind her. The idea of a gentlewoman in the mid-19th century made its way into popular consciousness via a book called The English Gentlewoman. This was a guide for young women of a certain class who were about to come out in society as debutantes and basically contained all the advice they'd need to lock down a husband. The book's aim was to promote the manners, charm and intellect of an accomplished young woman and it includes etiquette tips and advice about how to ensure that one doesn't come across as too learned because heaven forbid you might know more about something than a man. The book is, unsurprisingly, given that it was first published in 1845, not for the modern woman. But the spirit of self-improvement still flourishes within its husband-finding fixation. From the preface. The object of the writer is, by the experience of a life passed in those circles which constitute what is called the world, to supply those who are entering into a new and busy sphere with some of the practical benefits of observation and reflection, to propound the elements of that species of knowledge which, contrary to other sciences, is usually acquired by blunders and errors, the lessons of which are often received with mortification and remembered often with regret. Reading through this old edition in the British Library made me think that if we put the same amount of considered work into ourselves as these hints to young ladies on their entrance into society encouraged, but rather than doing so to become a perfect vision of contrived femininity in order to honey trap a suitor, we did the work for ourselves. Maybe we'd be on to a new form of female power, a power that we find within and then project outwards so that we can be happily engaged in the world around us and the people we share it with. I've been working on my own version of self-improvement over the past decade. After hitting my lowest ebb, dealing with death, family dramas, and my own unfulfilling relationship, I found a way to slowly build myself up again, really getting to know and like myself, finally feeling grounded, confident, and happy, and seeing my emotional and physical well-being not in isolation, but as intrinsically connected to the other people in my life, and the choices I make, became a project I was reaping the benefits of. I learned that it was through care, thoughtfulness, and empathy that we really inhabit our best self, rather than just activating it, when we think people are watching. And now I feel able to give this way of being a name, it's becoming a gentlewoman. And I am on a mission to reframe the word gentle as a source of soft power in the 21st century. Soft power. American political scientist Joseph Nye is credited with first defining soft power. The term is most often used in a political sense to mean a persuasive approach to international relations, typically involving the use of economic or cultural influence. But in the context of an individual, demonstrating soft power means showing rather than telling, connecting with others, listening, taking time to think before acting, playing the long game, not looking for a quick fix, showing empathy and kindness, being diplomatic and building trust. Most of us already embody some characteristics of a gentlewoman, but the stress of a high pressure job, a busy social life and demanding relationships with friends, lovers or family can throw us off our course. The result is that we are less kind to ourselves and others less happy and less able to fulfill our true potential. We react irrationally, make bad decisions and live with a simmering dissatisfaction with the world, which makes us reach for various panaceas. We disappear into social media where we can curate a version of our life and opinions instead of engaging with the messiness of reality. We drink too much, eat too much, go to the gym too much as we try to appease that sense that something is missing. Does this feeling that you can't quite settle within yourself resonate? 
You start projects but abandon them or they just fizzle out before you've achieved anything. You download apps to track your sleep, your workouts or the number of steps you've taken in a day in the hope that these steps, a solid number you've achieved, will somehow fill the lack in your life of anything more substantially satisfying. I believe this vacuum is the result of living in a world in which, as the philosopher Jean Baudrillard famously wrote, the image is more real than the real. So much now is surface, and I'm not saying the external signifiers of a good life don't matter. I like a curated Instagram account as much as the next person, but I understand it is simply aesthetic. Decoration is the last thing you do to something built from scratch. First, you must work on the foundations, the structure. Construct something strong that will last. If this is how you approach creating the life you want for yourself, then everything else enriches rather than comprises your sense of self. This book will get under the skin of every aspect of your life, from the importance of creating a happy home and delineating a space that is just yours within it, to learning to enjoy being alone. I'll explain how to thrive at work by allowing yourself to be truly seen, and the importance of building meaningful relationships. I'll cover how a gentlewoman knows when to leave a party, has the right clothes for every occasion, always lays the table and makes the bed, is a generous host, is never late or too early, sends handwritten notes, and knows how to use a power drill. These things may seem like frippery to the ungentlewomanly eye, but they matter. They show a respect for yourself, and if you care about the little things, it stands to reason that you navigate the bigger, more challenging areas of life with care and attentiveness too. How to be a gentlewoman is not a quick fix ideology. It involves recognising that the key to better living and greater happiness at work, in love, and with our friends and family is something we achieve by looking inwards and then projecting outwards. Today's gentlewoman is a woman of character. She has a strength born of experience and a charm that lights up a room. She is courteous, even when such a value feels out of step with the just-do-you world in which it is permissible, even encouraged, to operate entirely from a place of self-interest, verging on narcissism. We've started celebrating individuality to the extent that we forget to invite anyone else to our celebration or show up at theirs. Cherishing what makes you different and unique, enjoying your confidence and cultivating a deep knowledge of and love for yourself shouldn't make you self-obsessed. But if it has, this is the wake-up call you need. When Melania Trump wore a jacket emblazoned with the slogan, I really don't care, do you, in the summer of 2018, it represented an idea of solipsism that, although we may not think we are guilty of, we retweet support for good causes, go on marches, and never use plastic straws. We often are. How much do we really care about other people's feelings and our own impact on the world around us? When did you last stop to think about why your work colleague is being extra panicky about a presentation? Or what the barista was thinking when you were talking on your mobile phone rather than engaging with them at the counter? Or how your mum feels when you don't text her back for a week? Or what's going through your partner's mind each time you forget to ask how their day was before launching into a diatribe about your own? How often do you see yourself from anyone else's point of view? Being a gentlewoman involves learning to pay attention to the world around you. I don't mean a digital detox. That's too much of a short-term solution, which involves escaping from rather than sensibly dealing with reality. Just look up once in a while. Take out your headphones. Turn off push notifications. If you consciously sidestep instant gratification for something more meaningfully gratifying, you will notice people and their moods, places and their beauty. And you'll notice something new about yourself in the process. Start asking questions, listening to and being interested in people. We need to seek out real-life connections, not double taps and follows, allowing ourselves time and space to be empathetic and emotionally astute in our understanding of others and otherness. Being a gentlewoman today has nothing to do with social class, background, money or professional standing. It has everything to do with a woman knowing herself deeply and using her stability to inspire, lift up or support the people around her. This book is about cross-examining our default settings, asking why we live and behave the way we do, and if, indeed, we can cut a new path. It will explore the happiness that comes from showing up fully and authentically in every facet of your life. But I know you won't start as a blank slate. If anything, you're a piece of stone, weathered somewhat, no offence, and maybe broken in parts, with pieces missing. But by the end of this book, I hope you'll have carved out a shape for yourself that is solid and grounded and quite unshakable. But why this and why now? Well, women today are under unbelievable pressure to be everything to everyone. Cool, smart, fit, thin, but not too thin, funny, but not mean, a supportive friend, partner and family member. To be successful and liked at work. To have opinions about politics, art and literature, as well as reality TV and Kanye West's latest tweets. It's exhausting. The last thing we need is another book that proposes a quick fix way of being. Another suit of armour, something we can take off and put on in order to become a more appealing person. In this frantic world, self-improvement methods can feel like further pressure and finding happiness becomes the next box to tick on our overflowing to-do list. Think how often you reply to the question, how are you, with busy. 
We wear busyness like a badge of honor. The more tasks we have to do, the more important we feel. But a gentleman doesn't need to be busy to feel valued. Of course, there are things you must do, but then there are things you agreed to do when you didn't need to, and for the wrong reasons. Maybe you felt guilty that you hadn't spent enough time with your extended family, so you agreed to host a big lunch when all you really wanted to do was collapse after a hectic week. Or maybe at work you say yes to helping out on someone else's project, or being the one who puts the majority of effort in for a presentation. Why? Because you think it will make you look good, or because you think it's good to look insanely busy? When did being busy equate to being successful? Busy women are in a constant state of reaction, taking on the next thing and the next thing, but never really engaging properly with anyone or anything, least of all themselves. If you are always responding to what is happening to you, there's less time to be proactive and really think about what you want to achieve and how you're going to do it. A gentlewoman doesn't care about clearing her inbox before filling her outbox. If she did, she'd be so exhausted by responding to other people, there would be little energy left for her own projects and purposes. It's not pleasant to be around someone who is stressed. Learning to put yourself on top of your to-do list and reframing busyness so that it feels enriching rather than depleting will help you focus on your own flow in life so you are less susceptible to absorbing other people's franticness. This book will help you manage stress through kindness to yourself first and then by default to those around you. We'll learn to recognise when being busy is a positive sign that we are living a full life and when it means we are piling more and more stuff into our world to fill a void. Devoting energy to one part of your life doesn't ever need to be at the expense of another, keeping everything on a slow, steady heat without having to turn one burner off to crank another up to full blast is a constant effort, but it's worth it. Get ready to interrogate how you live. I mean really live. And in the process, discover what lies beneath the emotional paraphernalia of work, love, friends, family that comprise the complicated miscellany of modern life. Delving this deep into yourself to find what anchors you isn't easy. It means being vulnerable and you must be brave to choose gentleness in response to harshness. You may have to unlearn instinctual habits, particularly in your relationships or career, that come from a place of defensiveness and soften your sharp edges. In an often cutthroat world, it's a challenge to channel negative emotions into gentleness. You may have to shut out the expectations of your friends and family, online opinions and Instagram-approved aspirations, as well as voices in the media that encourage you to embody predefined tropes. Are you a mumpreneur, a slashy, a zenial, a snowflake, Choose which box you fit into before they fill up. Society seems to scream from behind your phone screen. Labels are designed to contain you, make you easy to understand or place in today's world. But conforming for the sake of fitting a persona is futile. What needs to take place is a gradual casting off of all that other people may want us to be in order to decide for ourselves who we are and what we stand for. The truth is, there's never been more pressure to present pieces of ourselves to different people in different contexts. Your work self is different from your home self. The person you are with your parents isn't the person your friends know you as. This disconnected way of being is too rooted in control. Our desire to control the way we show up in the world comes from a fear of being judged, and also the taboo around letting an expression of honest feeling anywhere near our professional selves. Despite vast improvements in equality for women in my lifetime, we are still encouraged to see our femaleness in opposition to maleness. This binary approach isn't just limiting, it undermines the potential for our female energy to have a depth and complexity that we need to explore. And given that we spend most of our waking lives at work, this is a lot of time to spend suppressing swathes of ourselves that we fear may not be office appropriate. Holding something of yourself back is a kind of defensiveness, and it's not healthy. If you just exist from one scenario or drama to the next, you are a collection of experiences and not a solid person. This is a recipe for insecurity, stress, anxiety, and general dissatisfaction. It is the opposite of what it means to become a gentlewoman and show up consistently as your whole self in every aspect of your life. I don't think it would be very gentlewomanly to claim to have mastered the art of being one. I have been broken, had to gather up pieces of myself and try to assemble them into a new form. I don't mean I was an emotional wreck. What I mean is more that my sense of myself was fractured. I was different things to different people and that made it easy not to be honest with them and with myself. My life was compartmentalised and my emotions were too. I didn't like myself because I couldn't get a handle on myself as a whole. Lying in bed at night in the darkness, I felt that I was floating. There was nothing to ground me. I was really scared that if I opened all the boxes I had control of and let everything spill out together into the light, guilt, grief, anger, jealousy, sadness, anxiety, I would never be able to get myself back together. I was wrong. When my cousin Billy, who was more like an older sister to me, died aged just 31, I realised what a privilege and joy it is to be alive. I owed it to her to give my life its best shot. So I made a choice. 
I do not want the tragedies that befell my family or my negative experience in a decade-long relationship to become my entire story. I listened to the inner person I'd aspired to be for so long and took back the narrative of my life. I began fitting all the fragments together into a whole picture rather than various incomplete ones. I started by being caring and patient with myself and others. I decided to project positivity into the world and in response, good things started happening. My career took off. I broke free from that bad relationship, found real love. And one day I realized that this was what real happiness felt like for me. It became clear that I had constructed a way of being that I was inhabiting rather than adopting when, despite losing my dream job and having just discovered my wife was pregnant, I was fine. Nothing could shake the anchor I'd found inside myself. Challenges, tragedies, injustices are the stuff of life. I can't change that, but the structure, balance, stability and positive mental attitude I've found by trying to be a gentlewoman will always help me handle it. And now I want to share how possible it is to be a strong woman through the use of our innate soft power rather than by feeling the need to adopt a perceived tough masculine performativity. As you wake up each morning and check your phone, news from a turbulent world that appears to be hurtling towards destruction hits your home screen and reminds you of that which you cannot control in life. Unless you happen to be a global world leader reading this, in which case, carry on and thank you. It's never been more important than it is now to know yourself and commit to being your own best friend and ally through life. Because our response to this world and who we are in it is the only thing we can truly have power over. If we are going to live longer than our mother's generation, let's make the most of it. Let's live well and fully, be entirely present and confident that by being a gentlewoman, great happiness and success is ours for the taking. Herein lies a gentle antidote to the often brutal modern world. Chapter one, being at home. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do as we fill the tank ready to go on this epic road trip together towards happiness, fulfillment and becoming a gentlewoman, don't worry, I've bought snacks, is to look around at where you live or spend most of your time. When you put your key in the door, do you feel happy to be back or a nagging dread? I don't want to own anything until I find a place where me and things go together, says Holly Golightly in Truman Capote's Breakfast at Tiffany's. But Holly is a lost soul, disconnected and endlessly performing a version of herself. She's so unsettled she can't even commit to naming her cat. She lacks stability and as a result she feels at home nowhere. It is so vital to have a strong sense of your roots, the things that attach you to your world and to your experience of life. Without these foundations, you will be as insubstantial as Holly, forever a miss whoever you are. Have you ever walked into a building and felt instantly ill at ease? You can't quite put your finger on why, but there's something that's just a bit off. The longer you spend in the space, the more your spirits drop. You know immediately, instinctively, if the house you're viewing is the one or not. Get through the door and as the estate agent launches into a spiel about the fabulous ceiling height, you think, nope, next. Hotel rooms are just as susceptible to the subtle vibration of negative energy as dentists' waiting rooms. Because this isn't about decor, it's about the deeper character of an environment and the intentions of the people who made it that way. Our homes should be our sanctuary, somewhere that inspires us and makes us feel protected from the outside world. Whether it's a tiny rented flat above a kebab shop, been there, done that, or a suburban family house, you should never put up with a space that doesn't make you feel safe. It takes imagination, not money, to transform it. Your home truly is an outward reflection of your inner self, so identify what it is you are craving most. Security, love, comfort or company, for example. And turn the place you live into somewhere that can give you all you need. Start by making your bed every day, no matter how busy you are. If you are someone who thinks, what's the point if I'm out all day and I'll just get straight back into it once I'm home, then I'd hazard a guess that this why bother attitude has been born out of a sense that you don't deserve good things from yourself or others. But such a simple act of self-care sets you up not just for the next 24 hours, but for an entire approach to your life. This seemingly small act will help you to take more positive, self-orientated steps throughout the day. You have started as you mean to go on, making your bed matters because you matter. Gentle home hacks. Replace wire coat hangers with wooden ones and ugly chipped mugs with a matching set. Ceramic pans should take the place of old metal saucepans with burned bases and try swapping out dirty lace curtains with shutters and blinds. A mattress stopper is essential. And while you're at it, get rid of old sagging mattresses and those bed pillows you've had for years. Try goose down pillow instead. Raggedy towels should be replaced with soft, fluffy white towels and dying spider plants with fresh flowers. Finally, try smart light bulbs in softer, adjustable hues over harsh 100 watt light bulbs. You can fold your socks into perfect little Marie Kondo nuggets 
Curate your bathroom shelves so they are color coordinated and alphabetize your spice rack if you want. But these aren't really the things you'll miss if you're away from home for a period of time, are they? What we long for is the mood or sense of our space, the people we enjoy it with and the meaningful objects we fill it with. This is partly why Airbnb has become such a popular way to travel. We want to stay in spaces that are alive with the character and charm of the individual who created them. Learn to appreciate the importance of putting the right kind of care into the place where you live. By that I mean flooding it with light as best you can. Even if you live in a basement or have a wall in front of your window, there are always solutions. Also, fill it with colour, things that make you smile, and areas where you can sit and think or entertain friends. Every gentlewoman's home has a place to eat that isn't the sofa, and the table should fit as many people around it as possible. Because, as Virginia Woolf wrote in A Room of One's Own, one cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not dined well. Would Virginia Woolf have ordered Deliveroo and eaten it in front of her favourite Netflix show, RuPaul's Drag Race, from time to time? Had such things existed in Bloomsbury, London? Quite probably. Being a gentlewoman doesn't mean denying yourself occasional indulgences, but the benchmark for eating in, from which you allow yourself to deviate, should be enjoying a homemade meal at the dining table, even if you are on your own. There is no better way to survey your queendom and enjoy actually living in your home rather than just existing in it, in between leaving and getting back from work. We should aspire to create a nurturing environment where we can cast off the stresses of the day. Rather than crash out on the sofa, watching TV or staring at your phone when you get home, read a book in your favourite armchair, take a long bath, sit in the garden or have a glass of wine at the kitchen table. These are ways of taking good care of yourself by being truly present and engaged in your living space and giving yourself an opportunity to actually be at home. When I feel the creeping sense that my days are not my own and people, work meetings, chores are all one big whirly gig I'm losing my grip on, making a risotto in the kitchen makes me feel like I am back in the driving seat. As I splash a glug of white wine over the rice while it spits in butter and olive oil, I regain that happy relationship with my home and with myself. Covering it in parmesan and adding another knob of butter, I close the lid of the pot and just plonk it on the dining table with a nice bottle of wine and a green salad and everything seems right with the world again. A gentlewoman's self-nourishing risotto recipe. Get a saucepan of vegetable stock simmering. Then, in your best heavy-bottomed pan, melt a little butter and olive oil. Finally chop a large white onion, two cloves of garlic and a stick or two of celery, and transfer to the pan. When soft, add a mug of arborio rice. Stir it in the buttery oil for a hot minute or two, then grab a half-drunk bottle of white wine and generously pour in. Wait till this has all been absorbed by the rice before gently ladling in the stock, stirring constantly until each spoonful of liquid has been absorbed. Put the radio on, fix yourself a drink, don't stop stirring, and enjoy the process. It'll take about 30 to 40 minutes for the rice to be cooked, but use your judgment and add more stock if it's still too firm. Turn off the heat, grate a load of parmesan on top, cover. Serve with black pepper and extra cheese. Cooking forces me to be in the moment. If I stop stirring the risotto, it goes gloopy and is ruined. Handling ingredients, feeling the soft thud of a knife slicing an onion, the crack of garlic peeled from a clove, is the kind of physical experience I want after a day largely spent touching keyboards and screens. The internet of things fills me with dread. I don't want a connected home. I want to feel connected to my home. And having a fridge that tells me when I need milk is going to have the opposite effect. We now have apps to tell us when to breathe, when our period is going to start, when to leave the house to make an appointment on time, and yes, when we need to add things to a shopping list. These apps might make your life easier, but easy isn't necessarily what a gentlewoman craves. Give her something real and meaningful instead. She would rather remain at one with her health, her body, and the contents of her food cupboards than removed from them. Being domesticated doesn't sound very sexy, but if it means owning my space and finding the most joy within my experience of it, then wrap me in an apron and call me Martha Stewart. I'm as domesticated as they come. It's also so important to be in possession of the objects that will help facilitate your best home life. So vases, candles, good tableware, napkins, wine glasses. All these things matter not as objects in themselves, but as the experiences they represent. As the French existentialists notoriously decided over drinks in a Parisian cafe, you can talk about this apricot cocktail and make philosophy out of it. For a gentlewoman, desiring to own or consume nice things is not about being materialistic. Rather, it is a kindness to yourself to enable the happy moments such objects signify. Think of all the times you've had a great evening at someone else's house. You probably felt welcomed from the moment you stepped through the door. You were offered drinks, given somewhere comfortable to sit, and left feeling jolly, a little flushed with wine, but very well looked after. It is this kind of host that a gentlewoman should aspire to be. When my wife and I invite friends for dinner, we put care and creativity into the experience. We plan the menu, cook, and make what I quite grandly call a tablescape, but is in reality just a nicely laid table. If I have people in my home, I take great pride in hosting them. 
There's nothing worse than feeling like you are encroaching on someone else's space. And there have been times when I've been invited into someone else's home only to understand that my presence there is a burden. Then the furniture, the pictures on the wall, the overhanging lights suddenly seem to loom over me, whispering menacingly, you don't belong here. Things a gentlewoman has at home. At least six wine glasses. Extra full set of bedding, spare toothbrush and towel. Yoga mat. First class stamps. A ribbon and wrapping drawer. Teapot and cup set. Pack of cards. Bottle of whiskey or other emergency stash. Full length mirror by the door for yourself as much as guests. Fresh flowers or plants. A good bar of soap. A cushion that you love. Ambient lighting. A set of bowls. A spare gender neutral dressing gown. Ice cubes in the freezer. To start living as a gentlewoman, ensure you truly have a room of your own. This is non-negotiable. Maybe you live alone, in which case, revel in the opportunity not to have to accommodate someone else's collection of porcelain pigs. Most of us have to share our digs with friends, family or a partner, and in this case we must insist on a room or a corner, a coffee table or a shelf that is just ours, to represent our individual personality. No one else gets to put their things in, on or anywhere near this place because it is sacredly yours. When you look at it, you are reminded of who you are and who you want to be. Think of it as a living Pinterest board you've entitled Me, complete with postcards, books, objects, letters, awards, anything that has a significant meaning for you or inspires you in some way. What is the point of keeping all the mementos of your life hidden away in boxes? Bring them out into the light for people to see. Be proud of the stories they tell. These objects are the evidence of your reality, so own them in every sense of the word. Meet a gentlewoman. Brenna Hassett is an archaeologist who specialises in uncovering how people lived and died in the past. What evidence is there that tribes of ancient people created sanctuaries for themselves? Our ancestors were highly mobile. It's only in the last 15,000 years or so, out of 300,000, that humans have become sedentary. We may have, once upon a time, been like mountain gorillas, building a new nest each night. What survives in the archaeological record are layers of ash from our fires, the pits and stone walls of our shelters, and even the microscopic traces of reed mats and the debris from everyday tasks like cooking and making stone tools. What are the earliest recorded homes, and when and how did dwelling places become more what we typically associate with a home? Many of these shelters would have been temporary. However, people may have revisited certain locations over and over during their seasonal movements, and some places might have been important touchstones, quite literally, in their lives. Home, for our species, might be found more in our social units, revisited in familiar landscapes, or even something more active, like taking part in a ritual. Many day-to-day -day tasks that we now think of as occurring at home, cooking, washing, making things, would possibly have been carried out in a public, common space, reflecting how societies may have shared resources in the past. The invention of more private space may go along with changes in our society. Evidence from the archaeological site of a Shuklahoyuk, for instance, shows that a bit more than 9,000 years ago, previously communal features like hearths moved inside to become parts of private households. When and how did basic shelters turn into places with elements of decoration and possessions? Personal decoration and possessions predate homes by some margin, at least 40,000 years. It seems likely that we've always decorated our homes. There are traces of decorated plaster from many early villages across the ancient Near East going back at least 9,000 years. And even before permanent houses, our choice of shelter could be very artistic. Neanderthals are said to be responsible for some of the charming mammoth bone shelters found in Eastern Europe. As married or partnered lives merge, it's easy to lose track of what belongs to you and what is something you own together. And I believe this is a mistake. I'm not assuming you'll split up and abandon all your possessions, throwing just the bare essentials into a bin liner and leaving one night, never to return, as I did when I finally left my ex-partner. But I do think it's a mistake to entirely lose track of the things that belong just to you, because once you do, it's easier to lose track of yourself. And that is something a gentlewoman avoids like the Macarena at a wedding reception. The French philosopher Gaston Bachelard wrote in The Poetics of Space, The house shelters daydreaming. The house protects the dreamer. The house allows one to dream in peace. This is home at its best, when your living space is a base from which you can fly. But when you lose confidence in yourself and are overwhelmed by the stresses of modern life, the first thing to slip through your fingers is normally the state of your home. Dishes pile in the sink, unopened letters stack up. Nothing is put away and home becomes a place of conflict, where you argue about chores with your partner, kids or flatmate. Because the kitchen isn't clean, you don't like to cook in it. You order takeout and then stop even bothering with plates. If you think you don't deserve looking after, then why would you bother looking after your living space? The appearance of your home reflects your inner state of mind and self-worth. So when you start thinking things don't matter, that's when they matter most. 
It goes back to the importance of making your bed every day. When you are at your worst, put your best freshly washed and ironed sheets on your bed. It's a small change, but it can be the start of a new way of thinking and being kinder to yourself. As more and more life happens to me, I recognise the ability of the place where I live to anchor me to myself. Join my Patreon for more books on dating, femininity, healing, money, hypergamy and much, much more.